He completed medical school at an internship in internal medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine and Hospitals from 1982 to 1987. His residency in dermatology was at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire from 1987 to 1990 followed by a fellowship in cutaneous oncology and Mohs micrographic surgery in the Department of Otolaryngology at the Ohio State University Medical Center from 1991 to 1993. He's been in private practice in Northern Utah since 1993 and in 1996 became a part-time faculty member of the University of Utah Department of Dermatology. In 1999, Dr. Summers joined the clinical faculty of the Huntsman Center Institute and started Mohs Surgery Clinic at that facility. He continues in private uh, in university practice where his focus is on Mohs surgery primarily for non-melanoma skin disease. Uh, so the topic then is Mohs surgery overview and update. Thank you. Um, I hope you all heard the rain out there and it's making you feel really good that you're in here and not out trying to play golf this morning. So I appreciate being here. I appreciate the opportunity of uh, speaking at this group and with this group. It's a great uh, medical community here in, in Ogden and I appreciate the uh, chance to also practice here as well. So um, today we'll be talking about most surgery and we'll uh, give you a little bit of an over overview. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. And our goals are to review Mohs surgery. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, what is it for? How do we do it? The clinical, and then we'll review some clinical cases, uh, hopefully demonstrating the usefulness of Mohs surgery and also some uh, tips for skin cancer diagnosis. And also then talk a little bit about what's new in non-melanoma skin cancer. So to begin with, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the problem of skin cancer. We're really in an epidemic of uh, skin cancer in this country, three and a half million uh, cancers every year, uh, and one in five Americans will develop some type of skin cancer in their lifetime, and 40 to 50 percent of Americans who live to 65 will at least get one uh, base or squamous cell carcinoma. And it's not just a skin-only problem, as many of you know, uh, there are 2,500 deaths annually from cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So there are a number of treatments for non-melanoma skin cancer as listed, um, depending on the nature of the lesion, superficial or deep. Uh, there's topical treatments, uh, local destructive treatments. Uh, a variety of new creams are available. Uh, for the deeper lesions, we, uh, we think about Mohs surgery or excision or possibly radiation therapy. So what is Mohs surgery? Um, this has uh, been uh, somewhat of a source of entertainment for me over the 20 years I've been practicing here to see the confusion that uh, exists regarding Mohs surgery. I've seen a number of uh, interesting things written in medical records about Mohs surgery. Is it mole surgery? Uh, as, we, as you see, you may see a, a patient wrote on their uh, little intake sheet, mole surgery, that was the reason why they were there. Uh, is it Mohs surgery from the Three Stooges? Um, is it nose surgery as we see uh, often written uh, it's none of these, of course. Is it MOHS, M-O-H-S, an acronym? It's not really that. Microscopically oriented histographic surgery has actually been written in some medical journals. No, it's not at all um, an acronym. So MOHS surgery, uh, uh, let's go over a few of the uh, main points about what MOHS surgery is. It's named for Dr. Frederick Mose, who was at the University of Wisconsin and developed this procedure. And it's a process for removing skin cancer in a sequential, organized manner that provides for detailed surgical margin evaluation. Tissue margins are examined in a horizontal rather, rather than a vertical dimension. Most surgery has the highest reported cure rates for non-melanoma skin cancer. The Mohs surgeon performs both the excision of the tumor and the pathologic evaluation of the tissue specimens. And this is most commonly done in an office setting in an outpatient basis uh, with local anesthesia uh, with frozen section pathology done uh, in office in an on-site lab. And most commonly this will be done for non-melanoma skin cancer, um, basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. 
Most surgeons manage the resulting defect with immediate closure or by second attention healing. Uh, and patients with more complex defects, as you'll see as we go on today, are referred to a variety of reconstructive surgeons. Most surgery is extremely cost effective. Um, a recent study uh, looked at this and accounted for the recurrences with other treat metho treatment methods and found it to be actually the cheapest method for non-melanoma skin cancer treatment. So this is Dr. Frederick Mose from the University of Wisconsin. And just a little bit about the history. Uh, he was formally trained as a, a general surgeon. And as a research assistant, he uh, was injecting various substances into rats in the lab and uh, found that zinc chloride would kill tumors in rats but still preserve the, the architecture and histology. And so he devised this fixed, fixed tissue method of surgery, and it was called chemosurgery, where a zinc chloride paste would be applied to a tumor as the patient came in. Uh, it would actually kill the tumor cells. The patient would return the next day, and uh, the tissue would be fixed in place, and he would excise the tumor that day and then look at it under the microscope. And if there was still viable tumor, he would apply more of the zinc chloride paste. So that was the original method, and, and that's why sometimes today you'll still hear the term chemosurgery. This was his original report in 1941 of 440 patients in the archives of surgery. And then this is followed up in the archives of dermatology and syphilology. Uh, may, maybe some of you know that dermatologists used to be experts on syphilis as well. No longer the case. Uh, anyway, he presented his ser series on uh, chemosurgery of facial lesions. So as you might guess, there were some problems with fixed tissue Mohs surgery. There was, uh, there was pain, it took time, there was inflammation which limited reconstruction. And because of that, a fresh tissue technique was developed where the tumors were excised and frozen section uh, histology was done on site the same day. And Dr. Mohs reported in 1953 a case of eyelid surgery done with a fresh tissue technique uh, with a five-year cure rate of 100%. And then in uh, the 1970s, a uh, group in San Francisco made general use really of the fresh tissue technique. Dr. Tromovich really pioneered that. So this is not Dr. Mose or Dr. Tromovich. Uh, this is Ed Allen from Ogden, and I uh, wanted to give a nod to him uh, because he was really uh, one of the first people in Ogden who started doing Mose surgery, and, and probably in the state of Utah. Ed, are you here somewhere? In the back there, all right. Uh, so Ed could probably tell some history, history about the uh, early days of Mohs surgery in Utah. Uh, so let's talk about the Mohs procedure a little bit, and I thought I'd run through a case uh, and just kind of show you how it's done. So this is a patient that presented with a nasal tumor, and a little bit hard to see of this view, and that's how a number of our tumors are. They're, they're indistinct, they're hard to see really the borders. So we'll start by marking what we see or think is the border of the tumor. This is a basal cell carcinoma inject the local anesthetic, and then we'll curette the tumor, actually. As you, as you know, a number of these are softer, and curetting it actually helps determine a little bit about the depth and the, and the lateral margin. And then we'll excise the tumor, and you'll notice the scalpel is at a beveled angle, not really a, a, a 90 degree angle. And this is so that we can process this tissue in, in the horizontal sections. And we usually excise with about two millimeter margins of normal tissue. So this is the first excision uh, layer, and the tissue, as you see at the bottom, is marked and, and a map is uh, made, and, look, and then it's processed uh, with frozen section in the lab. So it's placed on a chuck, it's flattened, it's put into basically an ice ball, uh, frozen, uh, and this is the surgical margin we're looking at from underneath with a die, and the die helps us orient to right, left, top, bottom. And so this chuck can be turned in any direction and we'll still have the, the orientation in terms of where this cancer came from on the patient. Small little nicks were made in it and that's where the dye is and that's how we tell uh, where on the patient those, those uh, dye marks correspond to. Uh, the tissue is placed in the, the cryostat and three to six uh, micron margins or uh, layers of tissue are, are cut and then put on a slide and dyed. And the slides are then ready to read uh, and then uh, read. And this whole process takes about 20 to 30 minutes to get to this point from excision to, to the process. So in this case, uh, as you see in the top uh, middle, there is some residual tumor. Uh, 
there, and this is a close-up of the tumor, so this patient's first layer had, had a positive margin. So now we're going to go back. This has been mapped on our map as to where to go. And we're going to go back and, and re-excise. This would be the second stage of metal surgery. Re-excise only in that area where we found positive tumor. Same process, the tissue is dyed and mapped. And we find, again, tumor centrally. Uh, and we're going to go back then and excise, uh, but only centrally. We don't have to extend the excision laterally because we know the tumor is only in the deep margin. So that's our map for the third stage. And luckily, at this point, the, 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 the layers are clear. This is a, a clear piece of tissue without tumor. So this is the post-op defect after three stages of Mohs surgery done in the office. Uh, this whole process would have taken maybe two, two and a half hours. And there's the pre-op view and the post-op. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, skin cancers that are treatable with Mohs surgery, again, we, we generally treat basal cell, squamous cell because they're obviously the most common. But a number of uh, more unusual tumors are, are treatable with Mohs surgery. The general premise is that the cancer grows by direct extension and it's connected without skip areas. And so uh, with our, our layer by layer excision, we can follow those connections out. Uh, we do sometimes treat uh, lesions which are starred here, uh, which are, are, do have skip areas. We sometimes treat those with Mohs surgery. It's a little bit more difficult. Cure rates are a little bit lower in those uh, tumors. So let's look at the long-term cure rates for primary basal and squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, these would be uh, your standard basal cell squamous cell, not, not something real complex. And uh, as you can see, Mohs surgery has roughly a 10% uh, increase in cure rate over most of the other uh, modalities. Um, now, these, these numbers will change according to site, tumor type, and things like that. But this is for your standard um, everyday garden variety basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. So the problem with skin cancer is that uh, what you see is often not what you get. Um, for example, in this... Uh, I believe mock uh, digital uh, photo of, a, of an iceberg, we often, we can see the top, but what's below is really unknown to us until we start getting really into the tumor. Another way to look at this is uh, with this squash, which I found in our pantry at home, uh, unfortunately. So uh, on the outside, <laughs> the, uh, the skin is, is really fairly good. There's, there's you know, a few marks on it. There's a suggestion of something here, but it looks relatively normal. But unfortunately, once we get inside, and unfortunately for our pantry, uh, once we get inside, we find that this squash is really not so good. And so overlying a, a relatively normal surface, there's, there's some bad stuff. So let's look at the indications for Mohs surgery for non-melanoma skin cancers. We want to look at the tumor. We want to look at the, the background skin and the patient. Tumor probably most important, um, so we'll look at uh, whether or not it's recurrent, whether it's a high-risk histology, um, anatomic sites that are critical, and uh, whether or not it has perineur perineural invasion, the size and the borders. And background skin, uh, a little bit more concerned about radiation and, and a chronic scar and maybe a prior excision. And then in patient characteristics, the big one would be immunocompromised patients, which we're seeing more and more of. Um, and then patients with syndromes such as basal cell nevus syndrome. So why is most surgery more accurate for tumor clearance? If we look at traditional bread loaf histology, uh, these sections are cut vertically through an excised specimen, and these are only maybe uh, a few microns thick, and if it's processed in this manner, it's been estimated that the peripheral margin is only evaluated at, at about 1% or less, and so you may have little extensions of tumor that are missed with standard bread loaf histology. Again, a quadrant histology, same thing. There, uh, there, it's another way to do it, but again, these are vertical sections, only a few microns thick. There may be extensions uh, out which are missed on that type of uh, processing. So with Mohs surgery, um, looking here, we're excising, and there's a complete margin evaluation. So if there are these little roots, as we call them, or extensions, and they're going to be found on that margin because we're looking at that in complete margin, both peripherally and deep. So this is an example of a, a standard surgical excision, just to show this a little bit more. Um, this was referred to me as a recurrent or a persistent basal cell carcinoma after standard surgical excision. And the PATH report indicates that uh, tumor was present at the deep margin uh, and um, 
one ink peripheral margin. Well, the problem is, in this case, where along that margin is it positive? This is, this is the incision line, and it's at one lateral margin and at the deep margin. Well, is it here? Is it here? Where, where exactly is that tumor? So with, uh, in this case, uh, we're left really with no choice to re-excise the entire scar, do most surgery on that, and close the wound. Most surgery is also noted to be tissue sparing, and John Zatelli, one of the leaders in our field, recently wrote an article and, and did, did a study on this and found that most surgery re wounds require uh, flaps and grafts and complex repairs, much less than standard surgical excision wounds. So we think of ourselves as people who are both uh, sparing tissue and uh, getting a complete margin control and, and high cure rates. So I want to go through a few cases uh, talking about some skin cancer pearls and uh, how to avoid some disasters or at least know if you're in one or not. Um, I do have to read this disclaimer. Uh, the committee didn't make me do this. I just uh, These cases may have a history of diagnostic or therapeutic miscalculations, including by myself, uh, and are not attended, intended to point fingers. We've all been there. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is having a low threshold for biopsy uh, if a lesion doesn't respond to normal treatments and think outside the usual diagnosis. So what looks like a wart fungus or rash may not always be a wart fungus or rash. So um, I also like to compare this to snakes. Any snake lovers out there? So here we have two snakes that look very similar. Uh, one is bad, one is okay. One is poisonous, one is, uh, one is not. Who knows which one is the poisonous snake? So the right or the left? Right, right. okay, exactly. So on just a brief look, these both may look very similar, um, but one actually has a, has a very potent poison. So skin, skin lesions could be the same, same idea. So I want to start out with some genital lesions. Often here we think of rashes, fungus, intertrigo, all the stuff that happens down there. And uh, we want to think about skin cancer as well. So this is a vulvar lesion, uh, inflammatory, uh, a lot of inflammation surrounding it, some hypopigmentation. Most common diagnosis probably would be a, a chronic dermatitis or lichen simplex. This happened to be a squamous cell carcinoma on biopsy. So if you were to uh, treat that or excise it, if you could look at it and think, where would I cut? What, what would my margin be? Because there's a lot of inflammation and change around it. Here's the primary lesion, but very difficult to determine how, how big of a margin. So this is treated with Mohs surgery, and this is, uh, this is the defect after obtaining clear margins. Uh, penile lesions, so this is uh, a lesion, a patient that was referred to me and uh, had been treated with a number of topical medications for a presumed uh, inflammatory uh, problem. Uh, and also subsequently some local destructive modalities. Um, this uh, happened to be a squamous cell carcinoma, and we treated this with Mohs surgery. Um, and you see that we were able to spare uh, most of the uh, surrounding tissue, and uh, even the meatus, even though we had to go at that point, uh, th this was functional. He was repaired by a plastic surgeon and was functional. Unfortunately, uh, about a, a year after, he had a local recurrence right here, uh, which isn't uncommon with uh, penile squamous cell carcinoma. He ended up, unfortunately, having inguinal, inguinal adenopathy, uh, was treated with cisplatin and radiation, unfortunately failed that, and ended up with a partial penectomy. So penile squamous cell carcinoma is a difficult uh, thing to treat sometimes. There's actually even a 32% recurrence rate after most surgery, so even though we advertise a 99% cure rate often in some tumors, uh, that, that rate is not as good as we advertise. So uh, lymph node mets are, are relatively common. Uh, the issue that I just want to present is that, that uh, penectomy may be recommended for this, and the suicide rate for penectomy, I don't have the exact numbers, is actually fairly considerable, so that our goal with most surgery is to eradicate the tumor and hopefully prevent penectomy. Uh, BCC and SCC in young patients uh, don't presume a lesion is behind just because the patient is young. Um, the number of women under 40 diagnosed with BCC has actually increased dramatically recently. So this is a patient who um, had this lesion developing in his teenage years, actually, and it was neglected for many years because it was assumed that he was too young to have basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. 
So it grew and grew and grew, and uh, biopsy actually showed a basal cell carcinoma. They can occur in young, young people. So this was the, the preoperative markings, and this was the defect after excising it. So there was a, a fair amount of subclinical spread uh, after all the uh, years it was left untreated. And here's the patient repaired after a nice job by one of our local uh, reconstructive surgeons. Hand and digit lesions. lesions. This is a lesion that uh, very commonly would be uh, taken for a wart. It looks like a wart. It smells like a wart. I don't think it tastes like a wart, but anyway, it looks like a wart. Um, anyway, this was a, a periungual squamous cell carcinoma, which we were able to treat with Mohs surgery. And uh, after a skin graft, we see that the nail unit was preserved, um, and the uh, patient was uh, functional with that. Here's another lesion uh, around the digit, uh, treated conservatively for a long time and um, with some local destructive modalities. Um, anyone want to venture a guess as to what this is? Any takers? So looks a little bit like a bleeding wart, um, just a little odd. It was treated as fungus and some other things. Uh, this actually turned out to be a periungual melanoma. Treatment for this is not Mohs surgery. We don't do everything. This, uh, this would be treated by amputation and sentinel lymph node biopsy, which for this patient luckily turned out to be negative. Another example of a hand lesion, a squamous cell carcinoma, uh, treated with Mohs surgery, and you can see that the tumor extended down to uh, the tendons, in which we were able to preserve with the Mohs technique, but um, a little bit difficult to tell exactly where that margin might be, and we ended up excising sort of in an oblong fashion to get out the tumor, which may not have been predictable beforehand. Beware of the red eyelid. Uh, not all eyelids are, uh, are red from seborrheic blepharitis. Uh, this is a patient that came to me complaining of a recurring uh, irritated eye. And uh, a little bit dark, sorry about that, but there happened to be a little tiny ulcer right at this point, which made me suspicious for basal cell carcinoma. And a biopsy was done and, and actually confirmed that. So this is his defect after excising the lesion with, with Mohs surgery. Pay attention to those little crusty things that bother patients and seem like nothing important. We see these things all the time and sometimes we want to pass by them or maybe just do a freeze on it and, and hope the patient doesn't ask about it anymore. Um, so this is a patient that had a little crusty thing on his nose and this is after the biopsy so we're not seeing it uh, in its original form. Uh, but the surrounding skin all looks really quite normal and uh, this is something that we potentially could have just frozen and, and passed by. Um, unfortunately, this turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma with perineural invasion, and, and uh, much of that surrounding skin that looked normal extending up into the uh, periocular area had, had tumor involvement. Uh, and so these can be very surprising in terms of what's really there uh, based on what you see initially. So this is an example of the, the pathology you might see with perineural squamous cell carcinoma. This is a peripheral sensory nerve surrounded by this rim of, of cancer cells. And these things can grow for long, long distances uh, without showing any surface change. And unfortunately, that's what happened with this patient. So here's some side views of him. And here's uh, this patient again after reconstruction. Again, great job by one of our local reconstructive surgeons. Here's another example, small ulcer uh, surrounding tissue looks relatively normal. Uh, you might think there might just be a small basal cell carcinoma in this location. This happened to be a perineural basal cell carcinoma. Uh, resulting in a full thickness defect uh, through and through on the nose after Mohs surgery. Uh, and again, a, a great result uh, after reconstruction. So perineural tumor growth, uh, I think I just lost, there we go, um, may occur um, in about 10% of all uh, tumors, especially in infiltrative subtypes. The thing to note is that perineural tumor growth doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate to symptoms. You might think there'd be, there would be tinging tingling or burning in all these cases, but it only occurs in about, in about 5 uh, or 40 percent of cases. <clears throat> Perineural squamous cell carcinoma also um, is, a, is a bad disease and uh, something that, that really can um, uh, uh, have some bad complications if not treated aggressive, aggressively. So another uh, case just to show you is uh, uh, that, that uh, maybe we should sometimes question authority and and ask uh, really what is there. This is a case that was sent to me as a squamous cell carcinoma after doing Mohs surgery. 
Um, things looked a little unusual on the histology, and so I sent it for permanent path and found actually there was actually melanoma in uh, this as well. So this is a combined lesion, with melanoma and squamous cell carcinoma. This required extensive wide excision, and the patient unfortunately had uh, positive cervical nodes. Uh, skin cancer may look like normal skin. Again, we talked about this before. This is a normal scabby basal cell carcinoma. And this patient presented with what looked like relatively normal skin. And he was complaining of a little bit of tingling and numbness. And that was about all. Unfortunately, he had another perineural basal cell carcinoma with extensive resection necessary. And again, some pictures of the, the nerve involvement. Um, and that's after his reconstruction. So uh, we're going to move on here a little bit and just get to uh, a little bit more running out of time. So um, um, we're going to get to a little bit about what's new um, in non-melanoma skin cancer. So uh, sorry about the, hope that doesn't bother your breakfast, seeing those. Um, at any rate, uh, in, in, uh, as far as what's new in non-melanoma skin cancer, I wish I could tell you there was an iPhone app for, for doing this or treating skin cancer. Unfortunately, there is not um, as of yet. Most surgery is a time-tested procedure, which really is done a, very similar to the way it was 40 years ago. Uh, there is some research being done on, on tumor imaging in terms of trying to determine these tumor margins before we get in and start doing these large resections. Uh, unfortunately, these methods haven't, haven't really, as of yet, uh, proven to um, be reliable. Uh, there are some uh, groups even that, that uh, have meetings regarding this uh, new research. Uh, superficial radiation therapy is something that's making a comeback. It used to be common in dermatolo dermatologists' offices, um, but because of the technology, the machines were bad, uh, it kind of fell out of favor. And uh, this is actually making a comeback. Here's one of the machines that you can buy for $220,000 with a $22,000 service contract every year. I don't think that a lot of people will be running out for these right away, but you might be seeing this uh, in the future uh, in office, superficial radiation therapy. Photodynamic therapy is another uh, uh, option which is being studied. Again, not real reliable yet for deep tumors, but for superficial tumors may be an option. Um, uh, the newest and uh, most exciting thing really is uh, what's come out with targeted therapy for basal cell carcinoma uh, with hedgehog, hedgehog pathway inhibitors. There's a drug that was approved in January of 2012 called Vismotigib, uh, and it's indicated right now for metastatic basal cell or carcinoma or uh, uh, locally advanced BCC. And it, um, it interrupts this hedgehog pathway, which is not really going on in most of our tissues, but uh, in basal cell carcinoma, for some reason, 90% of these have this pathway activated. So it b blocks that, really. Uh, the exciting thing is that uh, even though it's not a total cure, that uh, we did in the trials, there was a 20% complete response in locally advanced basal cell carcinoma and uh, a reasonable response in, in, in uh, uh, the other categories. So that uh, what we may see for unresectable BCC and, and these large advanced basal cell carcinomas uh, is, is in the future is a really viable medical treatment rather than surgical. Um, I don't know that we're really there yet, but, but I think it is coming. And the other exciting thing is that in patients with basal cell nevus syndrome who get multiple, multiple basal cell carcinomas, uh, this drug was shown to really be uh, fairly exciting. In the, tr in the treated group, they only develop two new basal cell carcinomas a year versus 29 with the uh, placebo group. And so this is a patient with BCC nevus syndrome uh, that had a, her first basal cell carcinoma treated of the eyelid when she was 19, and subsequently went on to develop multiple, multiple, multiple carcinomas, which is, which is common for these patients. And so this drug could really be a god, godsend, or drugs like it that are coming down the, down the pike. Uh, there are also trials going on for uh, more normal basal cell carcinomas right now. So uh, maybe my job will be replaced by a drug at some point. The uh, Husband Cancer Institute, by the way, is uh, going to be involved in a study of a similar drug in the same category if you have patients who, uh, who may be interested in that. So the bad news, uh, just, to, just to finish up, is that human behavior is still what it is. Uh, the CDC just came out uh, recently with data over the last 10 years in terms of sun protective behaviors. And just to point out a couple of things, 
sunscreen use in men is still very dismal, around 15% nationwide, and it really hasn't changed over 10 years from 2000 to 2010. So uh, men put on your sunscreen. Uh, women uh, do a little bit better with sunscreen. Sunscreen use hovers around 35% in women. It has gone up maybe slightly, uh, but, but really uh, not much. You'll notice that women don't really like long sleeve shirts and wide brim hats either. Only about 5% uh, do that. So, uh, and, and perhaps one of the most interesting statistics is that the prevalence of those who have had a, a sunburn um, uh, in the year 2000 and the year 2010 uh, didn't change one bit. The, the data was exactly the same in that 10-year period. So I'm not really sure what we're doing in terms of education and behavioral modification. It seems like we're, we're about the same as we were 10 years ago, but this is really the challenge. And um, this is an area where you can all help tremendously. So it's my hope that with new research, we don't get into these type of scenarios. Um, sometimes after surgery day, I kind, of, I kind of feel like we're at that point, but uh, but I think with, uh, the future is bright in terms of re uh, reducing chances of that. So thank you very much. I appreciate being able to speak. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. What do you do to hold their hands while they're gradually losing, seeing their nose disappear? <laughs> I have some great MAs and nurses, so they do a great job of that. Uh, my yes. question is along the same line. We saw the initial injection. What type of anesthetic technique do you use? Are they conscious during the whole procedure? How, do you, how do you schedule your day uh, when you get into an extensive procedure like that? Are you calling in specialists at that point? Or you know, it's pretty complex. We'll, we'll usually treat anywhere from uh, six to eight patients in a day. Uh, it is a local anesthetic with, with lidocaine. Occasionally, we'll use some Valium. So it's an in-office in, in procedure. We're not really putting in people asleep. I know some Mohs surgeons who do um, use midazolam for that. But uh, if a patient is unable to tolerate it, just can't do the in-office procedure, then um, we have a couple of options. One of the most surgeons in Salt Lake, Dr. Bowen, who you'll hear from this afternoon, and I recommend not, not missing that lecture, uh, can actually take those patients to the OR. or uh, they go to the OR for a standard resection. So we are limited somewhat to the office, but patients usually do, do really, really well with it and, and tolerate it fairly well. How about the risk of skin cancers on, uh, with tanning beds? Uh, great, great question. And the, the man right behind you, our president, Dr. Allen, has, uh, has really more information on that than I do. The risk is definitely there. Uh, Dr. Allen was instrumental in, in getting legislation, legislation passed in Utah uh, restricting tanning bed use. And uh, David, since you're at the microphone, maybe you want to comment on that. Sure. Uh, thanks, and Brett, thanks for that great lecture. It was wonderful, a good overview of Mohs surgery. Uh, so uh, the, the risk, uh, according to uh, the uh, Centers for Disease Control, there was a, there was a study that was published. Um, it was a multi-area multi study that looked at if you, sun, if you sunburn just once before age 16 years old, your risk of all types of skin cancer, basal cell, squamous cell, melanoma combined, 75% uh, uh, increased over lifetime. Uh, risk of, uh, tan of tanning and burning in a tanning booth just one time increased your risk of melanoma over lifetime by 65%. Um, uh, if you uh, have over 100 sessions or 100 sessions or have tanned regularly off and on for a period of 10 years, uh, your risk of developing uh, non-melanoma skin cancer is roughly one in two. Uh, your risk of developing melanoma increases by approximately 150%. So uh, these are significant risks. And the reason I got up is, is to thank you, but also to just mention that uh, the Utah Dermatology Society, in conjunction with Pat Jones, who is the state senator who sponsored the legislation, and also with uh, thanks to Stu Barlow, who is also instrumental in helping us be able to pass it, we were able to pass uh, a law in, in the state of Utah that bans uh, all tanning of minors ages uh, um, 15, well, uh, under the age of 16, I'm sorry, under the age of 14, uh, and it uh, puts significant restrictions on those ages 14 to 18. What it does is it requires not only parental consent, but the parent has to be present at the time that their minor child decides to tan. Uh, now, um, 
with, with that legislation, we're following several other states and also kind of leading other states and hoping that the trend continues. What we'd like to do is just ban it all together under the age of 18 population. But I get a lot of patients that come in and they'll ask, uh, I'm going to Mexico, is it okay for me uh, to tan so I don't get burned because burn's bad? I'd, I'd be interested in your comments about this, Brad. My comment, my feeling is, 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 is tanning is bad, burning is bad. They're both bad. I wouldn't do either of them. Instead, I would wear hats, sun protective clothing, uh, where you have to put minimal amount of sunscreen on your hands and such. But, but, but really, you know, if, 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 if sunscreen, well, if, if sun protective clothing and shade and these types of things are the seat belt, then the, the airbag would be the sunscreen. Great, yeah, and, and I just found that over the years, I'm not going to have people stay out of the sun. They're going to they're go out. They're, you know, it's, we're, we're too active as a society nowadays. So I do the same thing. I mean, I just say, put on your protective clothing, put on your sunscreen, go out and enjoy life. Um, so, you know, I don't, David, if, if that's how you do it or not, but but it seems to work well. And I think the sunscreens are so great nowadays, even though there's a lot of controversy. Um, big big believer in sunscreen. I've been seen in the 20 years I've been in practice. Uh, patients who, who have had multiple cancers have started using sunscreen and protection, and I see a definite difference in the number of cancers we're treating in those patients. So I'm a very, very strong believer in, in using sunscreen. Good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, uh, I think we're on break now till for half an hour. And then